report, Susan Barrett. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I have a few announcements. Um, first, for the schedule for the rest of November, this evening, this meeting today, and then this evening back at the GMCB offices, we are holding at five o'clock tonight a primary care advisory group meeting, and that, as I said, starts at five. Um, and then we have a potential vote scheduled on Monday on the benchmark, and then um, most importantly for this week, we have the Rural Health Task Force uh, meeting up in St. Johnsbury tomorrow, after, <coughs> tomorrow no, all day, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, up at the hospital. So if folks are in the area and want to um, participate, I think that would be a well worth venture. Um, the other announcement is uh, just to update folks on the open public comment period for the ACO budget. We have moved it out based on the information we're going to hear today and some of the presentations and the timeline. So right now, that open public comment period ends December 2nd. And I would encourage folks to check out our website where we have listed all the public comments on the ACO budget to date. And that's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Oh, and actually, I do have one more thing. Okay. Um, General Counsel Barber has an announcement on a rate decision that he needs to read. So, okay. that's next. Thank you. Yeah, I just need to announce uh, a board decision regarding MVP's 2020 large group risk filings. On November 13th, 2019, the board issued a decision on the filing submitted by MVP Health Plan Inc. for its 2020 large group HMO products. Uh, docket number GMCB. 00819RR, as well as the filing submitted by MVP Health Insurance Company for its 2020 large group point of service riders, docket number GMCB 00719RR. Uh, the filings impact approximately 1,800 members in Vermont. The board ordered the carriers to uh, one, adjust their unit cost trend assumptions to reflect Vermont hospitals approved FY 2020 budgets add uh, 19 cents per member per month uh, that had been inadvertently excluded from the rates uh, for changes in benefits. Three, remove a $1.82 PMPM load related to an expected agreement with One Care Vermont. And four, reduce the proposed contribution to reserve from 2% to 1%. These order changes reduce the average rate increase across all quarter, quarters of 2020 from 16.7% to 14.9%. Um, as the board knows, these large group products are not community rated, and so the premium increase that a group will experience will differ from the approved rates based on the group's claims experience. Thank you, Mike. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, November 13th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, November 13th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So the next item on the agenda is the HIE plan. We'll welcome Sarah Kensler to come down. And whenever you are ready, Sarah, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, for the record, this is Sarah Kinsler, GMCB Director of Strategy and Operations. I staff the board's work related to biomedical information technology and health information exchange. Uh, the board has three major oversight responsibilities uh, related to vital HIE and HIV. Can you put the mic a little closer so that people can hear you? Is this better? Is it on? Can people hear back there? No, not not very really well. Okay. Okay. Push the button up. Okay. Three major oversight responsibilities related to 
vital HIE and HIT. Um, the first is to review and improve vitals budget, which we do um, in late spring every year. Um, the second is reviewing the State Health Information Technology Plan, now known as the HIE Plan. Um, GIVA is required to revise the plan annually with a comprehensive update every five years, and this year we're in year two of that cycle. Um, finally, the third responsibility is reviewing the connectivity criteria for providers connecting to the Vermont Health Information Exchange, or VOLTI. Um, VITAL is required to present criteria for approval annually before March 1st, um, but we started to review that annually in conjunction with the HIE plan. Um, the board approved 2019 connectivity criteria in November 2018 when it approved the HIE plan. Um, to support the board's re uh, review of the HIE plan and connectivity criteria, staff have developed the following principles for review. Um, these are the same principles that we recommended for review of the 2018 to 2019 HIE plan, um, and we've adapted them for this year. So there are four criteria for the HIE plan. And two for connectivity criteria, and we'll walk through each of those as we review the staff um, assessment. Excuse me, could you just put the mic a little closer, please? Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm still gonna use that wound voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so a uh, quick reminder of the process. Uh, Diva submitted the HIE plan to the board on November 2nd. Um, we held a, a two-week public comment period from Monday, November 4th through Friday, November 15th. Uh, on November 13th last week, Diva and Vital presented the HIE plan and connectivity criteria uh, at a board meeting, um, and then today we've noticed a potential vote. Um, does anyone have any questions before we start walking through the staff analysis? Thank you, Ray. Right. Good to go. Um, so now I'm going to walk through each of the principles for reviewing the staff assessment. Um, Title 18 describes the requirements for the HIT plan, including supporting use of electricity electronic health information, educating providers and the public, supporting interoperability, proposing strategic technology investments, and recommending funding mechanisms, um, incorporating and integrating with existing initiatives and systems, and addressing governance and security. Um, as submitted, the 2019 update to the HIE plan meets each of these criteria, building on the groundwork of last year's plan. Uh, in particular, this year's plan adds a roadmap for technology investments in the short and medium term. Um, in addition, effective March 2020, statute also specifies that the DHI will use an opt-out consent model. The HIE plan demonstrates strides for meeting this requirement on time, although as we heard last week, last week there are still some workloads to be uh, finalized prior to that date. Um, the second criteria is alignment with the 14 principles for healthcare reform that are um, better described in Title 18. Uh, in its 2018 decision to approve it, the 2018 to 2019 HIE plan, the board found that the plan spoke to several of these principles, um, and these areas really still remain core to the 2019 to 2020 plan and have not changed. Um, I've included a few examples here um, of, of principles that are particularly relevant to the HIE plan um, and how I think the HIE plan um, meets those principles. Uh, third principle for review is consistency with relevant legislation. Um, this year that uh, is mainly Act 53 of 2019, which focused on HIV consent, um, but we'll also touch on Act 73 of 2017 and Act 187 of 2018, um, both of which focused on HIE effectiveness in operations and governance. Um, I believe that the HIV plan meets this criteria, um, particularly sections four and five of Act 53, which, which require the HIE plan to reflect um, and opt out or presume consent policy effective March 1st, 2020, as we previously noted. Um, that will supersede parts of the current HIE consent policy approved by the Secretary of Administration and the Board in 2014. Uh, Deaver reported at the November 13th meeting that the workflows for that process are still in development. Um, and for this reason, I'll be recommending that the board uh, request an addendum to the HIE plan from DIVA that reflects Act 53 um, and will be put into effect prior to the March 1st uh, implementation date. Um, at this time, uh, or at, at that time, excuse me, uh, once DIVA recommends a replacement, I would also recommend sunsetting the 2014 policy to limit confusion. Um, related to Act 73 and 187, the HIE plan also demonstrates continued efforts to improve HIE governance, operations, and effectiveness, um, which continue to be core goals um, of the HIE plan. Um, finally, the core principle for review uh, asks whether the HIE plan incorporates national best practices and expertise, as well as uh, feedback from Vermonters. Um, on the first question, alignment with national best practices and expertise, 
Um, this year's HIE plan really builds on uh, the foundation of last year's comprehensive update. That update um, utilized national standards and models for HIE governance, technology, and financing, um, and really grew from, um, from models from across the country, from states uh, and other lo localities with uh, particularly effective and successful HIEs. Um, these best, best practices remain core to the 2019 to 2020 HIE plan. Um, regarding stakeholder engagement, DIVA and the HIE steering committee have sought sufficient, uh, significant stakeholder input on both the HIE plan and technical roadmap, as well as on the HIE consent uh, implementation from stakeholders. Um, the HIE plan itself uh, includes stakeholders from a variety of HIE constituencies, including primary care, hospitals, mental health, um, substance use disorder treatment, public health, um, the ACO, payers, technologists, and consumers, um, as well as uh, clinical state entities. Um, and in addition, DIVA staff and contractors sought feedback on the HIE plan and technical roadmap from providers, including um, the board's primary care advisory group and a number of other stakeholders, which are listed on the slide. Um, DIVA has held uh, also four focus groups with individuals who actually use the VHI, including care coordinators, data analysts, technical architects, and payers. Um, on consent, uh, Act 53 required a very significant stakeholder engagement in HIE consent policy implementation planning. Um, as you heard from Diva, um, they made a, a pretty large effort to engage stakeholders representing all Vermonters, um, including the ACLU and HCA, um, as well as groups representing populations who might have um, particular concerns um, related to privacy or require different communication approaches. Um, so this concludes the staff analysis of the HIE plan. Um, are there any questions before we move on to connectivity criteria? Any questions from the board? Great, thank you. Um, so now for the connectivity criteria, um, there are two principles for review here. Um, first, does the criteria align uh, with the HIE plan goals, support HIE plan implementation, and support the state health, state's health reform goals? Um, and uh, the answer, I think, is yes. Um, the 2020 criteria build on the 2019 criteria, which did meet the standard, um, and have added additional data elements to the minimum tier two data set um, to further align with stakeholder uh, program needs and define tier three potential data. Um, secondly, are the proposed criteria clear enough to be operationalized by vital state and providers? Um, the 2019 criteria were really developed with this goal in mind uh, and included specific standards and requirements um, that help Vermont providers negotiate with EHR vendors, which had been a weakness of the criteria prior to, to that time. Um, the 2020 criteria maintained the structures and, and added some further clarity, um, especially for tier three. Um, are there any questions on the connectivity criteria? Doesn't appear to be. All right. Um, so finally, um, the board received uh, two verbal public comments uh, at the November 15th meeting. Um, from the Office of the Health Care Advocate and Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, both complemented DIVA's stakeholder engagement efforts on the HIE consent policy change. Um, those are the only two comments we received from the public who did not receive any written comment. Um, so in light of um, in light of these findings from the public comment, um, the staff recommendation is to approve the 2019 to 2020 HIE strategic plan as submitted with the following condition. To comply with Section 4 of Act 53 of 2019, DIVA shall return to the board prior to March 1st, 2020 to propose an addendum to the 2019-2020 plan effective March 1st, 2020 to reflect opt-out consent and document how opt-out consent will be managed. Um, and in addition, uh, the staff recommendations to approve the 2020 connectivity criteria as submitted. That's all. Are there questions from the board? If not, is there public comment or questions? I don't see any. Um, does the board member wish to make a motion? I think it'd be appropriate to do two different motions. Robin? <laughs> I think Tom's ready too. Tom's <laughs> making moves. I, have a, I need some practice here, Bob. All right. <laughs> Um, so I recommend approving the 2019-2020 Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan as submitted with the following condition. To comply with Section 4 of Act 53, 2019, DIVA shall return to the Board prior to March 1st, 2020 to propose an addendum to the 2019-2020 HIE Plan, effective 3-1-2020.
reflect opt-out consent and document how opt-out consent will be managed. Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Would someone wish to make a second motion? I'm gonna roll here. No. <laughs> I recommend approving the 2020 connectivity criteria as submitted. Is there a second? Okay. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. So next, we're going to invite Sarah Lemberg and Michelle DeGree down. And we're going to be talking about the 2020 Medicare benchmark. close to the mic or using your extremely loud voice because for some reason the sound is not carrying well. Okay. Uh, all right, so Sarah and I are here to talk, to talk about, uh, I'm going to give a quick all pair model update and then Sarah's going to walk through the Medicare benchmark recommendation. The APM update is one for the slide. <laughs> uh, so we just wanted to really give an update to the board and the public on timing of reports, um, as we are expected to be producing several, as you can see um, in item number three, we've got five upcoming deliverables. Um, but uh, we also made some changes to annual report or to reporting, which we have brought to your attention before. I and mean, I just want to highlight, um, we did add an annual total cost of care report to allow for adequate claims run out. We also, um, have been approved to move our statewide health outcomes and quality of care report um, to the end of this calendar year, and that's due to many factors, um, one being claims run out and another being availability of data from our external data sources, um, including RFS, CDC funding. Uh, we've got a couple of current issues that we're working through. Um, as everyone knows, Blue Cross has a new claims processing system, and that change has created some delays in VCURES data. Um, and we're also working to procure a risk grouper, and that has to do with our payer differential assessment report, which is also um, due to be completed um, by the end of this year, but we will be requesting an extension due to that um, procurement. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Take it away, Sarah. Good afternoon, my name is Sarah Lindberg. I'm a health services researcher with the Green Mountain Care Board. And I'm here to review uh, the staff recommendation for the 2020 Medicare benchmark. So just as a reminder, what is a benchmark even? You throw that word around a lot. A benchmark for Medicare is a financial target that is set for each participating ACO in the Vermont all-payer model ACO agreement. So we only have one ACO operating at the moment, so there's only one target that we need to set for 2020. Um, and basically what happens is a target is set, which was, was demonstrated by this green dotted line, and then the ACO's performance is assessed relative to that target. If it's below, savings, the ACO keeps the dope. If it were to go above that line, it would be a loss and the ACO would be paying Medicare back. So it's very similar to how the other programs work. Uh, but uh, what we do that's a little bit different maybe than other programs is we're setting two different targets. One for um, beneficiaries who are living with end-stage renal disease and one uh, a separate target for those who are not eligible due to that. The reason for that is that while they are a small population, they're extremely expensive, so it adds in some risk mitigation for the ACO. And so the benchmark for each of these subgroups has three main factors. An estimate of historical experience, a number of prospectively aligned beneficiaries, and a trend rate. So the historical experience is basically our best guess about what this population would cost to date. 
Uh, the tricky part is that 2019 is in progress. So we have to do our best to estimate what we think the 2019 experience is gonna be in order to apply an annual trend rate. That is what the board votes on. This is what the board is trying to estimate the growth will be for the upcoming year. And then the aligned beneficiaries are the factor that we have the least control over. Um, that's uh, gonna be folks who attribute to a Vermont provider. According to the data sharing agreement we have with the federal government today, some people who attribute to Vermont providers don't necessarily live in Vermont. We are only allowed to have data for folks who live in Vermont. So we don't have the full census of the ACO population today. So uh, we want to make sure that the data we do have available represents the ACO population, but it's not going to be a one-to-one. -one. We are working to get a different data share of the federal government, which would allow us to have the full picture. Uh, so that is the benchmark. So uh, historically speaking, uh, the board didn't have the capability to work on setting that historical experience number itself. Um, and so it worked in partnership with the federal colleagues in order to get that best estimate. In order to better fulfill the duties of the Green Mountain Care Board as envisioned in the agreement, we're actually taking on that task this year and using that data to do our best to estimate what the, the experience seems like it has been for folks who would attribute to One Care for 2020. And one critical difference in the way we're approaching the modeling is that we think it's really important that we say, okay, so based on this 2020 network, who would have attributed to the ACO back in 2011? NC, <laughs> read, rinse, repeat, who would have attributed in 2012 based on that provider network? So in that way, you're looking at a series of rolling cohorts or a rolling population over time. And as you can see, that looks much different than if you say, okay, who is going to be attributed in 2020 and what is their historical claims experience? When you look at the historical claims experience for the actual Bennies, you can see that as they get younger, and some of them even haven't um, been eligible for Medicare back, not, back in 2011, we're really underestimating the historical spend. So to best represent the risk the ACO is facing, we need to look at these rolling populations. And the main difference is that because it's a Medicare population, we're expecting a certain amount of mortality every year. So folks are gonna die. And um, those end of life care costs are quite expensive. Uh, we estimate around $4,000 per member per month for beneficiaries who pass away during the performance year. So that's one of the big deltas we see um, as these kind of timelines converge, but we know that everyone in this 2018 bucket is still alive because they are going to be attributed in 2020, whereas folks have passed away during the course of 2018 when we take the cohort approach. Probably a lot of just boring detail, but it's a really fundamental, important assumption that we've taken in our modeling. The other thing that we've done is said, you know, some exclusions can't be calculated during a performance year. As an example, if um, it seems like my primary care relationship is with a Vermont doctor and I was aligned to the ACO, but it turns out I end up getting the majority of my primary care in Boston, there's a protection built into the network where that person is taken out of the population for settlement purposes, saying, you know what, we thought you were gonna be on the hook for them, but it turns out that's not really your patient, so we're gonna take them out. You can't figure out who delivered most of the care, whether it was in the Vermont network or somewhere else, until after the year is over. So we think it's really important to use complete claims so that when we can model the final settlement values, so that when we are setting a target ahead of time, it's the same number that the ACO or participating provider would expect at the time of settlement. So those are kind of some of the important things that we're doing when we're modeling our estimate for the experience. The other uh, second component of our equation are the prospective banks. Again, that's the number that we, over which we have the least control. Um, but there's really two different numbers in play here. There's not more than that, but for this particular thing, there's two. So there is kind of this prospective benchmark and or scale population. 
So that's the full number of beneficiaries who are attributed to the ACO. Attribution is completed six months ahead of the performance year. So for this 2020 population, they were attributed back in June of 20, what year are we? 18. <laughs> yeah, so they, it was there back in June of 18 is when we cut off the experience. So not everyone is going to survive until, uh, no wait, 19, sorry, 19. I've been looking at too many years in concert. So start over. All the beneficiaries who the ACO has on the list for 2020 won't show up in January. So some of them will die between June of 19 and January of 20, or might lose eligibility for other reasons. Maybe they move away um, out of the country, maybe they sign up for Medicare Advantage, uh, maybe they get a job and Medicare is no longer their primary payer. So this prospective target is the ceiling of the possible patients the ACO will be accountable for. Come settlement time, that number goes down, and it always will go down. It's a one-way one rail. You can only attribute off, or, or attrit off, rather. <laughs> so this is our estimate for where uh, we think through September, uh, the number of people who have already lost eligibility stands for settlement. That number will continue to go down uh, for people who lose eligibility in October, November, and December of 2019 as well as um, after the year's over, we'll figure out those folks who ended up getting most of their primary care somewhere else, and they will be taken out for settlement purposes. So um, that is uh, very much a moving target, and again, the one over which we have the least kind of information. Uh, we can do our best to kind of estimate with data available about what we're missing, um, but it does seem that uh, there's not a huge difference in these populations. So the data for whom we, uh, the folks for whom we do have data seems to be pretty similar to the ACOY data that is uh, shared with us uh, with what, uh, from our federal partners. And last but not least is the trend factor. So that's the real decision point. So again, that's where the board says, okay, where, what do we project or what are we guessing is a fair amount of growth for the ACO to expect from, 20, from 2019 to 2020. And there's some guardrails around this according to the all pair model agreement. So every April, Medicare Advantage puts out what's called the final announcement. And what that does is it has kind of the estimates of rates for um, people who want to bid to provide Medicare Advantage um, for their capitated rates. Capitated is a stretch, but for their base rates. And those estimates include fee-for-service projections, so these are guesses for the full national Medicare population over time. And what they, nationally, what they said is, given in April of 2019, given the best data available, we think the per beneficiary per month in 2019 for those folks who are eligible for reasons other than end-stage renal disease will be just over 900 bucks, and we think that's gonna go up to uh, 941 in 2020. So that projected growth, again, this is just a guess for the national fee-for-service population, is that it's gonna go up by 4.16%. Similar exercise for the ESRD beneficiaries is 3.14. So the agreement says that the highest trend that the board is able to use for this is 0.2 percentage points below this. So basically the ceiling on the allowable trend available for the board to use in calculating this is 3.96 for the non-ESRD benchmark and 2.94 for the ESRD benchmark. I will say that um, Vermont growth has historically been less than the national projections and in you know, recent years even national growth has been a little bit less than the national projections, but you know, guessing is a hard thing to do. Um, some years you get it right, some years you're way low, some years you're way high, but um, hard telling not knowing. So uh, again, based on the data available to us, uh, the recommendation that staff are making is that for the non-ESRD population, that a trend rate of 3.5% should be used to set the Medicare benchmark for the ACO. Uh, the rationale being that as the scale increases for Medicare, uh, this is being more and more influential on our all-payer target. So there's kind of two things we have to do. We have to stay below that 0.2 projection and we have to convince our federal partners that 
it also will allow us to meet our goal of a total cost of care, all payer total cost of care growth of 3.5%. So uh, this $9,765, that's a per beneficiary per year estimate. Um, that is uh, subject to change as we are having more data available to us um, and it's something that we're still sorting through. Uh, multiplied by the prospective bennies and the recommended trend rate would be uh, per be beneficiary per, mem uh, per month target of $842. So the, the idea would be that at settlement, this number would stay fixed and the only number in the equation that would change at settlement is this number right here. So again, that's the people that have lost eligibility along the way. So that number just goes down at settlement, but we would want to lock in the per beneficiary per month. Amount. Have you done any calculation on the volatility of that 72 to 357? Volatility? Yeah. Uh, what, what, what would be the range one way or the other that that could change? Oh yeah, so it'll only go down. Uh, and this is the this is who is attributed. This is the 2020 population. Right. So that that is fixed. Uh, it will go down. Um, it should go down less than it did in 2018. Um, so I would guess probably about 85 percent of that is what's going to stick around for settlement purposes. So 85 percent is the best guess. Yeah. And Sarah, um, you touched on something that. I think might be important to make more explicit, which is while the board votes on the trend factor, it is still subject to CMS approval. That is true, yeah. So um, it's not up to us. What we do is we make a proposal and then CMMI says, yes, go ahead, or says no, and we have an opportunity to revise it and resubmit it. Uh, it must be approved by CMMI before the end of the calendar year. No Are there any guardrails to their approval? So the things we have to prove is that it's staying within 0.2% uh, below the national projections and that it allows us to meet our all-payer target of 3.5%. There's also some language about making sure it doesn't create any unfair discrimination or something like that. Um, so there, there's a few other kind of details that we need to prove, but the big, too big from a financial perspective are all pair three five is, a, is is achievable with our proposal, and that we're using point two below the national projection. So can you just talk a little bit about we're using the trend rate of three point five. The actual that came out would have been three point nine six, right? So, so the, the maximum allowable was three point nine six. Correct. Right? Yeah. And then I just did a quick calculation just to see what that would be off the seven hundred thirty one. Million is like 3.2, 3.3 million dollars, yeah. and part of that is we're saying a because of the scale that we're achieving, as well as is it compared all of the prior savings that we've gotten the past two years? Yeah, and also how it falls into our all payer targets. So um, this number, for an, a financial accountability perspective, for, for our obligations under the agreement is actually quite a bit higher. Um, so we have to include everybody statewide. We also um, have to include any savings as, as part of our spend. So we need to make sure that all those things combine um, and keep us under that 3.5% compounded uh, annual growth. Any other questions? All right, so uh, ESRD, again, uh, many fewer beneficiaries, uh, and the advice here would be to use the maximum allowable trend, which is 2.9%. Uh, this population is extremely small and extremely volatile, so we do think it poses relatively more risk, so um, we would like to recommend that you use the, the maximum allowable trend for the ESRD population, um, with the same caveat that the experience number is still um, uh, being refined. That might not be the final proposal. Um, and then finally, uh, in the past few years, there's been a shared savings component to the benchmark. And the recommendation here would be to um, support uh, the ACO in continuing its funding of the blueprint and SASH. So in their budget, that was uh, just under 8.3 million, 8.29. Uh, and we would recommend that we include that in the benchmark, and CMMI has agreed that they would continue to advance those shape, uh, savings, 
<laughs> savings uh, to the ACO and so that they may pay them out for the blueprint. It helps with some cash flow. Um, and then the understanding would be as just to, as it was in 2018, that would be factored into the settlement. So um, any savings on top of that would be what the ACO would net. So uh, from a calculation standpoint, uh, that's what it sugars out to. Uh, the seven, uh, just under 759 would be a much higher number than you saw in the ACO budget, and that's entirely driven by uh, attribution. So their attribution numbers are quite a bit higher than they projected in their budget. Uh, what other questions, comments, or concerns can I try to address? You might, you might just explain that between the ACO budget and what you're projecting here, what were the moving parts and attribution? Because you and I agree that you, you have it almost within the penny in terms of tracing per member per month, but the actual attribution numbers have changed quite a bit. Yeah, that was I think, a surprise to everyone. Uh, but the only the major changes to the ACO's Medicare network was uh, Springfield no longer participating, uh, and the addition of several FQHCs into the Medicare line. And the thinking is that the FQHC has brought in quite a few uh, attributed lives. I I just want to make a comment about the blueprint and sash piece. Um, because that was really an important part of the original negotiation was ensuring continued Medicare support for both the blueprint and SASH. Uh, with SASH in particular, uh, that program is almost 100% supported by the Medicare dollars. There is some state dollars, I believe, on the administrative side. But um, so I think that's an, a very important piece of this whole calculation. So I understand the important piece of the calculation. I'm just questioning. Um, why the link to the benchmark since it's in the, the budget? Because uh, that is how CMMI is able to fund uh, that investment is through the benchmark calculation. They otherwise don't have a pot of money that's sitting around any longer to fund those demonstrations. It quite frankly wouldn't have been, uh, I think, the negotiating team's first choice, but it was what was allowable under the federal provisions. Other questions for Sarah and Michelle? Is there any public uh, comment? Walter? As someone who has been taken out before, meaning I've lost my insurance. I'm curious what the phrase take out means in this case. So for uh, financial accountability purposes at settlement, uh, who stays in for the ACO's financial settlement are folks who remain eligible for the full 12 month period, which means they retain both parts A and B of their Medicare, and Medicare is their primary payer and uh, that they receive the majority of their qualified evaluation and management primary care services within the ACO network, or uh, they all that was true up until the point in which they died through the course of the year. So it's people who were eligible the full time or who were eligible up into the point of their death. So those are the two groups that stay in for settlement purposes. Now the ACO is still accountable for anyone attributed to them, but it doesn't factor into the financial settlement. Okay, strictly the Medicare population. Yes, sir. Oh, um, little bit for, excuse my ignorance. I'm new to this. Um, what does uh, this ESRD actually stand for? End stage renal disease. Okay. Chronic kidney failure. Yeah, very expensive. Yes. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Good. Uh, Susan Aronoff from the Vermont Disabilities Council. Um, I noticed a new phrase both in this document and in the savings, I'm sorry, in the uh, 2018 results document that was posted that's going to be discussed this afternoon. It's the, seems new to me, um, phenomenon of referring to the funds that pass through from the feds to the state to support blueprint and SASH, 
those funds are now being referred to as something called advanced shared savings. And they're showing up in the Medicare savings uh, for today's slides as if they were savings from operating the Medicare ACL program. So I'm just wondering if you can tell me, Mr. Chair, is this a change of term that the Green Mountain Care Board came up with, and if so, when? Or was this a change in terminology from our federal partners? So I'm not aware that it's a change, but I'll refer to Sarah Lindbergh who might be able to better answer the question. Whether or not we were consistent in our nomenclature, that's always what it's been characterized as. So even in the agreement, the 7-5 is characterized as advanced shared savings. Uh, could you explain what you mean by the 7.5? Uh, so, so in the uh, all pair model agreement, uh, $7.5 million is earmarked as advanced shared savings uh, to represent the historical investment in the MAP-CP program demonstration. And that was um, advanced and then netted against their 2018 performance. So they said, okay, we're, we're, we're expecting you to save at least this much they ended up, um, so that was factored in to their performance. So I think the, the gross savings was around $13 million, but after you take off the 7.7, .7, they netted about $5.5 million. So the money, I'm just trying to understand this, because my understanding is that that's money that comes into the state that gets distributed through one pair. We've all seen the hourglasses, the money comes in and goes out through one pair. But it goes to non-participating communities yes. as well. So I was surprised to see that money being spent, you know, just that's passed through one care was somehow being attributed to one care savings. It is. So they're they're at risk. So if they were to um, save less than eight point two million dollars, they'd be paying that money back. And it might be helpful to reference the federal evaluation for the the medical home programs in which uh, prior to this agreement, the blueprint was funded by Medicare through uh, MAPCP, which stands for Medical Home um, Program. And the federal evaluation of those programs across the country largely were inconclusive in terms of savings. The blueprint and SASH, however, had very good federal results that did show Medicare savings. And so the reason that the federal government was willing to continue that investment by advancing the shared savings was because they expected that that underlying program, which the ACO is required by law to build off of, uh, those savings are built into our projections. So it has always been considered and part of the shared savings component and the ACO has been at risk, even though you're correct, uh, there are participants who receive those dollars who are not ACO participants. So I would like to renew, Mr. Chair, I believe I sent you an email about this in the past and I'll, I'll follow up with another. It would be really helpful to get the Medicare results in the format that we're used to seeing them, which has something like the total expected cost of care and the actual total cost of care because throwing in this Medicare money that's just being passed through to the state um, really makes it hard for us to look year over year, just to, in general, the years of operation of this particular ACO, One Care, to see how it's performed in Medicare. It's been in Medicare ACOs of one type of another since 2013. And by now blending these advanced share savings into the charts that show savings, um, Green Mountain Care Board is really adding a new element in its data reporting that makes it very difficult for people like me who are just trying to track this, the numbers, follow the numbers, and do the math. Um, you're changing the format. So if we could so get the again, cost. Again, I'll just repeat, I don't think we are changing the format. Well, and we can only provide Medicare res payer results in the format that Medicare as a payer is willing to provide them. This is not an area that we as a state have authority or control over. It is an area with which Medicare as a payer controls. So is Medicare no longer providing the, the total actual cost of care and the expected cost of care? I think there was some results presented today, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's not in your results. It's good segue. Medicare, so another factor, Mr. Chair, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Medicare, the Innovation Center, has a great
great website that shows where innovation is happening all over the country. And you can click on the innovation website and look at the results of the accountable care programs and the shared savings programs and the bundle payment programs all over the country, um, all different kinds of exciting innovation going on. Because, and in the past, until Vermont had its own unique product, you could click on the results of all of the next generation ACOs or all of the any type of ACO Vermont was participating in, and you could find track the community health center's results on the chart with all the others, and you could find one care. But now, because one care is in this unique product, and Vermont is so unique, we're in this unique product, you can't find those results any longer. And I have emailed with um, CMS, won't surprise you, I'm not even getting responses, but I haven't given up. Um, but I've been emailing with both uh, CMS and with you folks to try to get the kind of numbers that we used to have, which were the basic, what's the total expected cost of care? We're gonna see that for Medicaid, we're gonna see that for Blue Cross, I think we should be able to see that for Medicare. Total expected cost of care and the actual cost of care. Just those two numbers. Can we get those? For Medicare. Yes. Okay, today, sometime? Well, right here is the expected for 2020, and we'll be sure that uh, uh, I'm clearer I'm about um, what it is for 18 and, and other It's the 2018 results that we're getting. So that's a yes. Okay, great. Can I just clarify something? I don't. It's been a while since I looked at this, but I don't think the blueprint money actually flows through the state. I do believe that flows directly from CMS to the ACO and then out to the providers. There's an agreement between uh, DIVA and the ACO about the exact formula they're going to use, but um, there's an, the state's not an intermediary for those funds. So. Other public comment? Thank you both. Thank you. So now we're going to uh, transition to a discussion on the 2018 ACO results. And, um, Mr. Chair, can I? Yes. I'm looking at Abigail, who has asked for just a small break so she can set things up for everybody for this discussion. Do yeah. we have some people that uh, are on the time? So we might be running a little early, too. So I'm yeah, I was looking, looking at, at the clock, room. which was a big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now we're off. I think I'm looking at the audience for others who I'm expecting. I see one, two. I think we're missing our uh, Medicaid folks. So uh, we are running early. I, I think that it was scheduled for 2.30. Yeah. I know this is going to ruin everybody's schedule here, but I think we're going to go into adjournment until 2.30. Um, I know nobody likes that, but that's a 52 minute break. Thank you. Now, I'm getting a lot of people that are saying, what if they get here early? So let's, let's adjourn till 2.15, and then we can make a decision at that time. Not by that clock. I know. Right, it is now 1.48. Okay.
So just in terms of talking about measuring performance, we wanted to do some background on uh, making sure that we're keeping all payer model performance separate from ACO performance in today's presentation. So as a reminder, the ACO has contracts with payers. They are here to talk to you today about their performance for 2018, which is performance year one of the model. Uh, separate from that, the state has their agreement with, the all, with CMMI, the all pair model agreement, that has separate performance and quality measures that we are responsible for reporting. <laughs> you will, um, myself, Sarah Lindbergh, Elena, and others, will uh, be presenting those results as they become available and as we submit our final reports to the federal government, again, for performance year one of the model. Um, so we just wanted to talk through some, some quick stuff. So again, finance and quality outcomes for both um, all pair model and ACO. We're here today to talk just about ACO. Um, and a reminder that trend analysis is not available until there are comparable data at two points in time. Um, and we also just wanted to point out that an early indicator of ACO performance could be in the reallocation of resources, and we heard some examples of that at the ACO budget uh, presentation a couple of weeks ago. Um, for example, the palliative care that was brought back to Porter Hospital and independent primary care in Williston hiring NPs to offer uh, psychiatric services to patients. The most fun. This slide is made by Sarah Lindbergh just as a review of data timing. So I just want to say this is sort of like a moment in time look at how data process through these years. Um, so this is, again, just a reminder of how long it takes for these things to be reported and validated, and then for us to be able to produce results and reports on these things. Um, this graph represents three months of runout. For all of our annual reporting for the model, we use six months of runout, so add three. Just another look. Uh, at how data come in. So um, the impact of claims right now is pretty significant. As you can see, about a third of the claims that were incurred in 2016 were processed by the end of 2016 uh, in comparison to the end of 2017. Um, so while working toward pay alignment is the primary goal of the all-payer model, not all of the payer programs are equivalent in terms of the financial and quality requirements um, outlined within the payer contracts. So, um, so just to outline kind of high-level comparison across these payer programs um, in terms of risk arrangement, they're, while they're all two-sided, the risk corridors are quite different and there might be different rules around truncation of outliers. Um, whether or not they offer fixed perspective payments may differ across these in 2018. Um, and whether or not they um, require reconciliation at your end. Furthermore, they're all quite different in terms of how attribution works. Um, I should say quite different. Medicaid is modeled off of the, the Medicare methodology, but there are some caveats there. Um, anyway, so this all to say that while these programs are all talking about dollars and quality and, and there's movement towards alignment, um, you know, year over year as we move forward in the all payer agreement, um, these are in 2018 still um, quite different. Um, to add on to that, um, in terms of quality metrics, uh, just a reminder that as we review 2018 quality performance by payer, um, not all measures overlap with those in the model or between payer contracts. The ACO payer agreements allow for variation in their quality metrics selected uh, to be specific specific to the population that they serve. So for example, um, it wouldn't really make sense to include a lot of adolescent measures in the Medicare set, but it does make sense for Blue Cross and Medicaid. This is really small, I know. <laughs> um, so this is just kind of showing a crosswalk of the first column is the all-payer ACO model measures. So this is the agreement measures. Again, so these are just the ones that utilize claims or payer-specific surveys. The all-payer model measures column here does not include any of the population-based measures that utilize other methodologies. So graphics, vital statistics, they're not on this list. Uh, the second column is the Medicaid Next Generation 2018. 
16 quality measures. The third column is the Medicare Next Generation 2018 quality measures, and the final is the Blue Cross. Um, this crosswalk is just helpful to frame up and sort of, you know, see how we're moving towards alignment. Um, and then, as you'll recall, As you'll recall, uh, the ACO, um, we have the ability to design the 2019 Medicare program through the agreement. Um, and so I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on. But just a reminder that these measures are 2018, they change for 2019 payer programs. Um, so to summarize, so today's presentation is really about 2018 all payer. I'm sorry. ACO payer performance based on the contractual obligations and it's not an evaluation of the all-payer model. And as Michelle um, mentioned earlier, you know, the GMCB will uh, present on an annual basis um, and probably more frequently finance and quality metrics as the model progresses. Um, additionally, CMMI will hire um, or has hired an external evaluator to assess the performance of this um, agreement. Before we move on, does the board have any questions about the nature of the presentations today and, and the broader context? I don't see any. Okay. So, so we'll, we'll start. We're, we're here in the shoes of Medicare that cannot be with us today. Um, so Michelle and I will walk you through um, what we know today. So this slide might look some a little familiar. Um, this breaks down the ACO's total cost of care relative to um, the expected versus the actual um, total cost of care, acknowledging that there's this difference between the advanced shared savings and the shared savings for which um, the ACO is at risk. Um, so the 5.6 million in shared savings is, is the net of that amount, and the 7.7 .7 is the money um, that, that the ACO has to um, earned back um, to pay for the Blueprint for Health, um, SASH, and the community health teams. So as I alluded to earlier, um, the quality measurement alignment for 2019 was done during the 2018 year. That was a process that you may recall Pat Jones and I did and presented to the board on in conjunction with feedback from the healthcare advocate and one here Vermont. Um, this is just a reminder based on the crosswalk I just showed you that moving forward, we've used authority within the agreement to design a quality measure set that more closely aligns with the agreement and other payer programs. Um, while we're spending today talking about 2018, I just didn't want to lose sight of the fact that we have done work to really align these things moving forward. So let's talk about 2018 quality results. Um, this slide comes directly from One Care's presentation. It's available on our website. Um, it was submitted as a supplement to their budget. Um, it's important to note here that benchmarks are moving targets based on historical performance nationally. Um, and something that we just really want to reiterate is that changing population demographics and provider networks make comparison between uh, years very difficult, if not ineffective. Um, we um, want to be careful and caution folks who look at increases or decreases between annual performance results um, be done with extreme caution and note all of the caveats in terms of changing uh, providers, uh, changing uh, participants. Um, and we don't have data yet to do a trend analysis, but as we start to achieve scale, uh, that's something we may be able to pr uh, produce analytics at sort of a deeper level as we move forward. But again, this is 2018 results that were based off of the Medicare Shared Savings Program. We changed the quality metrics for 2019 and moving forward, so the trending between those two won't be able to exist for quite some time. Um, I think this is a question that a lot of folks have, so we want to make sure that we walked through um, how the results were framed in one year's presentation, and um, that is that the earned score was 100%, and for purposes of the participation agreement between one year and CMS, year one was a reporting only year, and that resulted in a 100% score. 
Um, this is absolutely standard practice for all Medicare ACO models for year one. In addition, CMS regularly uses reporting only status for new measures or measures that have had significant methodologic, methodological change. <laughs> Um, and those result in a, in a two-year reporting only um, reporting only measure. So after they're introduced or any changes are introduced, it is common practice for this to be reporting only. Um, and I will just note that as of this morning, the 2018 performance nationally, I know that's a comparison that the board and others would be interested in, was not yet available on the CMS website. You can download performance results for specific ACO programs, but they have not produced their um, fast facts on the aggregate level as of yet. It's not publicly available. So when we do eventually come back and present you know, year over year data and, and kind of dig into a deeper analysis, we wanted to um, highlight some exogenous factors um, that you, know, you should consider. One of those, um, the first being is attribution. So as the uh, growing provider network um, kind of continues to develop, you know, you're going to have different populations and then you're comparing different groups. Would you prefer that all, all claims be held to the end? This is kind of an unusual thing where have somebody here that with their hand waving, but typically we, the board would ask questions and then we would go to public comment. Um, we're almost done with our Medicare portion. I, I think we could take a question on this section and then, you know, I just, actually I feel like we should move forward because we only have an hour, right? I, I just don't want to cut anyone's time off. It's up to you, okay. So we're gonna hold public comment until after we get through the presentation and then we'll get all kinds of questions. Okay. Yeah. A, a comment. I thought they were going to go over the results, and they just had the slide of the results up, but now they moved to another slide. Well, we're not talking about the. Well, do you want? Is there anything more to say there, Michelle? What type of detail are you looking for on the results? I guess would be a question to the board. Well. Well, speaking for myself, I reviewed the slide deck prior to uh, the presentation, so I didn't actually, I personally did not have any questions on these results on this particular slide myself. I agree with that. Okay, so then we'll go back through the exogenous factors. Okay, so attribution, so growing provider network. Um, payer churn and attribution methodology, these all affect kind of who the population is that we're talking about. Um, another exogenous factor is related to the Vermont population demographics. As you know, we have an aging population with often greater acuity. Um, policy changes also affect um, the results, the quality and fiscal results. So delivery system changes, changing payment system, payment performed waivers might render some added noise or confusion when interpreting. Um, statistical um, measures. Okay, so that's the end of our Medicare section. Um, we're going to pass it over. Uh, good afternoon, Corey Gustafson. Do we need to introduce ourselves? Thank you, Thank you. Corey Gustafson, Commissioner of the Department of Vermont Health Access. Uh, my department is the um, piece of AHS that is executing on the um, ACO agreements. Um, so just to sort of kick off here, I'm going to say a couple things in general. First about um, just DIVA as, a, as an entity, we have prioritized value-based payments and as um, a focus for our organization along with information technology projects, improvement in that area, and performance um, overall. Um, they all um, are important in areas where we feel that the state can um, greatly improve in its execution. Um, we've made great progress, and I think these results today um, demonstrate that. I think it is not a waste for me to, to sort of to one quick high level of what we're trying to do with this model. We've, um, as you've heard before from many people, fee-for-service, fragmentation, and unpredictability of the um, healthcare payment in the system is, I 
thing where we focus in trying to execute, and so, or the, the problems we're trying to solve. And so, and the last, I think, the unpredictability of payment, you're gonna see in the results today, something that will um, sort of speak to that and show us, okay, the principles under which we're operating our program um, are perhaps giving us some good indicators from 2018. So that unpredictability is, um, if uh, utilization uh, spikes for uh, for a population, it's good for uh, providers and it's not good for payers, and the vice versa is is not good for uh, providers and and good for payers. And we're looking for a little bit more predictability on both and stability in pain on both sides. And I think that's um, an important note or footnote before we get into our results that. Um, you know, those that are, are looking at 2018 for an evaluation, set that as your, um, uh -huh, okay, I see where they're trying to go with this. And, and, and just principally for us, or the principles under which we're operating our, our, our efforts are really trying to introduce risk to the provider community, um, make that as our payments in a prospective fashion, and then promote alignment where possible, both on the payer side, that's why we're all sitting here today, but also through our relationship with, with the ACO, um, you know, assist where we can their alignment in the payer community. So um, there's the theory, and what we're talking today about is the execution. So I just wanted to sort of set that table for um, Alicia starts talking about our results. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Alicia Cooper, Director of Payment Reform, Reimbursement, and Rate Setting for the Department of Vermont Health Access. So with that introduction, and before we take a look at the 2018 results, we wanted to offer a reminder about our Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO contract term. The original contract was a one-year agreement for the 2017 calendar year and have four optional one-year extensions. Diva and OneCare have triggered one-year extensions for each the 2018 and 2019 calendar years, and we're currently in the process of negotiating another one-year extension for a 2020 contract year. After 2020, the parties will have an option for one additional extension thereafter. Um, we renegotiate our rates on an annual basis, and to the extent necessary, reconciliation may occur more frequently, although we've not needed to do that thus far in our program implementation. So we'll begin our review of the results by highlighting that Diva and OneCare continued operations and used the 2018 performance period as an opportunity to make incremental programmatic improvements. By continuing operations, um, we at Diva feel that we've enabled another year of testing this model, which, as Corey mentioned, is a priority to us as a payer. Um, this also means that we, across our department, have continued evolution in how each of our functional units approaches their work and how that work is evolving in light of having an increasing uh, number of our Medicaid beneficiaries in an ACO model. We've also looked at opportunities for programmatic improvement to continue helping structure the program in ways that will best enable providers to participate in delivery system reform. And one of those areas that we would highlight for 2018 is continued expansion and evolution of our waiver of prior authorization requirements. Uh, in the first year, as you may recall, we had a waiver of prior authorization that was specific to members who were attributed to the ACO, providers who were participating in the ACO, and services that were part of the ACO's total cost of care. We learned from working with OneCare and their providers that this didn't necessarily enable the easiest referrals inside and outside of the network of providers. And so in 2018, we expanded this waiver of prior authorization to all Vermont Medicaid providers. So it still had to be for an attributed member and for a service and a total cost of care. But now those referral patterns could happen a little bit more organically and wouldn't necessarily be limited to um, providers 
in the network where there might be easier rules around prior authorization because of the waiver. Uh, we see this as an opportunity to further decrease administrative burden for providers, uh, both those providers who are participating in the ACO network and providers in the broader Vermont Medicaid network, um, relying on their clinical expertise and decision-making on caring for patients rather than traditional utilization management methods. A second area of results that we would like to highlight is that the program continues to grow. Um, we have now had two complete years of program performance. We're in our third year of performance and we're planning for a fourth year. Uh, and across that period of time, we have seen uh, incremental growth in the number of health service areas that are participating with One Cares Network the number of unique Medicaid providers who have agreed to participate in this model, and as a result of that, the number of Medicaid beneficiaries who have been attributed to the ACO through our Vermont Medicaid Next Gen program. And without going into a lot of detail on the summary table, I think the thing that we would like to note at this point is that uh, as we started the program in 2017 with 29,000 attributed members, and we're now looking into a 2020 performance period. We are looking at potentially 86,000 Medicaid members attributed using our traditional attribution approach for the Vermont Medicaid Next Gen program. And we're also looking at expanding our geographic attribution, which was piloted in the 2019 performance year uh, to apply statewide, which could increase that number further beyond the 86,000. In speaking a bit about the attribution, we wanted to take a moment to highlight how we've been thinking about those opportunities for programmatic improvements over time. I think the attribution example is a nice way that illustrates how we've tried to take this year by year and look at opportunities for adjustments. In 2017, our methodology was aligned very closely with the methodology used by the Medicare Next Generation ACO program. In 2018, we made some additional refinements to our Medicaid methodology, uh, recognizing that the Medicaid population is a little bit different than a Medicare population, and that there were opportunities for us to uh, also take feedback from the provider community and from OneCare about primary care relationships versus specialty relationships. In 2019, we further adjusted our base methodology to look at a longer look back period. Uh, and we also began a pilot of geographic attribution in the St. Johnsbury HSA. Um, through this, we've done uh, a bit of learning in this 2019 performance year, such that we're looking at a statewide expansion of the geographic approach to attribution for a 2020 performance year. Through all of these changes, what we've been trying to accomplish is making our attribution methodology more tailored for a Medicaid population, and also making attribution more in line with how participating communities were thinking about accountability for the populations in their area. And so I'm sure there will be additional opportunities to learn from the geographic attribution in the coming year and more refinements to come, but this is how we like to think about continual improvement and refinements in a year-by-year in -year manner. The third result that we'll highlight today is around financial performance. Uh, Diva and OneCare agreed on the price of health care for the attributed population up front. And in 2018, the ACO provided approximately $1.5 million in care above that expected price. This financial performance was within the 3% risk corridor, which means that OneCare Vermont and its member providers paid this amount back to Diva. This slide is here so that we can just do a brief refresh on the financial methodology. We agree, as I said, to a price for the care for the attributed population at the beginning of the year. 
And that price is also subject to a risk corridor, which as uh, the Green Mountain Care Board staff mentioned, for the Medicaid program was 3% for the 2018 performance year. So in this figure, the price is the, the dark bar. The blue dashed line represents 100% of that price. And then the red and green dashed bars around that represent the risk corridor. And at the end of the year, we compare the price to the actual amount of money spent on services in the total cost of care for the attributed population. And wherever that actual expenditure is, we understand it relative to where it falls, either inside or outside of the risk corridor. The risk corridor serves a number of purposes. Um, one, it serves to protect against uh, anything that might be a catastrophic loss for the ACO or the provider community by limiting the amount of financial risk that they would have to bear. Uh, so anything that would be, in this instance, above 103% of that agreed upon price, something is something that TIVA would continue to pay. It also introduces some provider risk and sharing of that risk with the provider community and the payer in a way that we haven't had previously in a fee-for-service environment. So any expenditure that's between 100 and 103 percent, the ACO is taking accountability for. In 2018, the performance was in that range, and so DIVA received payment back from the ACO as a result. If the performance is within the risk corridor but below 100 uh, percent, because we've agreed upon that price up front, DIVA will ensure that OneCare has received 100 percent of the price. Anything that's below the risk corridor um, is ultimately returned to DIVA if that's where the performance would be. And this creates an incentive to spend that's in alignment with what we're expecting the total cost of care to be and to protect against potential rationing of care. So this next figure shows two years of performance side by side, uh, the 2017 performance and the 2018 performance, as you can see, were both within the agreed upon risk corridor in our contracts with OneCare. Uh, in 2017, performance was below 100% of the price, and so DIVA issued payment to OneCare up to that 100% mark. And in 2018, performance was above 100%, and so OneCare returned that difference to DIVA. Um, we think that this two years of performance within the risk corridor has been an encouraging signal about the potential of the model that, as Corey mentioned, prioritizes the use of prospective payments as an alternative to fee-for-service, and also sharing risk with the provider community in the way that Medicaid has not done previously. Now turning to quality results. Um, the ACO's quality score was 85% on 10 pre-selected measures. Uh, of note, OneCare's performance exceeded the national 75th percentile on three measures, uh, measures relating to developmental screening in the first three years of life, measures relating to 30-day follow-up after discharge from the ED for mental health, and 30-day discharge <coughs> from the ED for alcohol and other drug and user dependence. More detail is available in this slide. Uh, we won't walk through that in depth, but it is available here. Uh, this table is also available in the report that is linked on the prior slide. And the final result area that we'll discuss is expansion of implementation of the Advanced Community Care Coordination Model to all participating communities in 2018. Of note in this area, uh, OneCare distributed approximately $2.7 million in payments to 65 community partner organizations 
including primary care practices, designated mental health agencies, area agencies on aging, and visiting nurse associations for engagement in the care model. There was also notable uptake in the use of Care Navigator and training of community care team members in care coordination skills and core competencies. Um, so I think all of this speaks to beyond the quality and financial performance that we're seeing in this 2018 performance year, progress being made in the rollout of the care model. And then for our final slide, we wanted to note a couple of opportunities that we have an eye on as we look to move the program into another contract year. Um, the first is reviewing and potentially modifying DEMO's requirements for prior authorizations and service limitations. And this goes back to the beginning of the conversation around the waiver of prior authorizations. Uh, we've continued to learn from working with one care and their providers that something that would be of great benefit would be a single set of rules that apply across a payer population, perhaps ideally across multiple payer populations, but uh, in particular what we're looking at is restructuring some of our prior authorization requirements as Medicaid so that if a service was contemplated as part of the total cost of care, we may consider no longer requiring prior authorization for any Medicaid member, regardless of attribution status. And the hope there is that it simplifies workflows for providers that are participating in the ACO model, such that they don't need to know if a member is attributed or not attributed to know if they'll be eligible for the waiver. Another opportunity that we've identified is restructuring our utilization reporting to better understand patterns over time. Uh, we have had challenges in a continually changing cohort um, of individuals who are attributed to the ACO over the years of experience that we've had, as you saw on the slide about the program growing. Um, and underneath that, we have continual changes in the group of individuals who are eligible for Medicaid. And so we have a lot of dynamism, which makes it difficult for comparisons to be appropriate. And so we're looking at ways that we can improve our utilization reporting going forward. Good afternoon, uh, Kelly Lang, Corporate Director of Healthcare Reform at Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, taking this opportunity to really, for the first time, present our um, experience within uh, the ACO program, you'll see similar comparison as to the other payers. But wanted to start with um, a refresher of the Blue Cross vision and why we're doing this. Um, and the first word is together, and really that's the all payer model is that we're working not only at payers here at the table, but with the ACO, the providers, and the community providers. And if we're going to work on healthcare reform, we have to all do this as Vermonters. So that is really guiding and fitting right with the vision of Blue Cross. So jumping right in, um, you'll see we're going to, just making sure the slides are moving, it's a little hard for me. <laughs> Go in a similar manner. Um, but first, we want to uh, do a program term overview. Uh, 2018 was our first risk contract. Oh, thank you. You can help me. Thank you, good partnership. <laughs> um, 2018 was our first risk contract with the ACO. We did have prior shared savings experience. And this is for our, one, our qualified health plan lives that are attributed uh, to the one care primary care population. Uh, primary care does include nurse practitioners and primary care physicians. Um, it's similar to blueprint attribution. Um, we do have the 50 50 shared risk that was explained earlier. And within the 2018 contract, we aligned our quality measures, but also most of our contract with what Medicaid was working on. And to the extent as possible, Medicare being the next gen model, there's some specific differences there. But really, our contract is fairly aligned with the Medicaid model. 
um, performance and quality impacting the value-based incentive fund, which you've heard about through One Care, is also aligned along with the metrics that I just described. And we do actually have collaboration requirements in our contract um, for care coordination, analytics, gaps in care, so it's not just a simple financial and reporting arrangement. There's real requirements to have engagement between us and One Care. So jumping right into the quality results, um, try to take a lot of the information and you'll see it's very similar to the Medicaid ones. There are a couple differences due to the different population. I'm gonna walk through a little bit of this because we take the performance and how we score one care is one thing, but we dig into the quality results with one care and also within Blue Cross comparing um, to the extent we can to our non-attributed um, Blue Cross population, so we do have lives in our QHP that are not attributed to one care. And I included 2017's right here, um, but I want to caveat, which like everyone has done with their quality. Uh, 2017 was shared savings only. We had a different provider network. It was larger. We had a larger group of members, so I would not compare them in terms of a trend, but we use them in terms of indicators, um, which I just wanted to um, point that out. And there are some positive indicators here, and there's also indicators that we need to look at why there might be a drop in some scores or where we have opportunities together. Um, so pointing out what we saw as real positives, especially when we compare to um, Blue Cross results, the 30-day follow-up um, from discharge from uh, ED for mental health uh, had an increase up to the 90th percentile. This was a measurable increase in comparison to the non-attributed one uh, QHP population, uh, showing an effort to follow up on readmissions. One Care and Blue Cross have also worked to develop a better way to share um, mental health data, which we've talked about here before, um, in a blinded manner, but at least giving indicators, and we're working together to see how we can make improvement to the extent we can. Another um, result, which um, we did also see a measurable difference between the Blue Cross population was the adolescent well care visit. Um, looking at engagement in primary care, especially for adolescents, is really important in terms of the long-term health of Vermont. And getting that engagement, we did see a measurable difference. And then actually going back up to the first one, and this is one we've um, had conversations with um, internally and externally, but the 30-day follow-up after discharge for alcohol or drug dependence. There was an increase, there was improvement, but if you look at the benchmark nationally, and 19, almost 20% score gets you to 75th percentile. So as a nation, we're struggling on this. Um, we're struggling within the state. So it doesn't mean because there's full points, we're not still focusing on it. We're taking it off the scorecard for next year. There's plenty of room for opportunity. So I'm not gonna run through all of these, but we dig down into these to the extent we can and to see where we can focus attention. Um, and I can come back to any questions that there may be. So as we go through um, looking not only at quality, but where we say clinical, might also be termed utilization, I only use two examples here because this is something we're really developing with One Care. Or what are some indicators of how the um, population is performing? But as you do that, you have to see how the population is changing. And we actually compare the demographics of the qualified health plan population to that which we have at Blue Cross that aren't One Care members. And you can see there's an age difference. Three years is a huge, but um, the non-QHP population is a bit older. But the interesting part, which is when you actually look into the population, you're then looking at quality and clinical results, as well, the one care population is a few years younger. The um, risk that we've identified, and this is Blue Cross, this is not a risk adjustment, this is um, a, a review we do at Blue Cross. The case weight or the risk of the population is greater at one care. So when you look at performance, you have to consider the population they're working with, and it has increased risk over time based on our review. So using that, with the increased risk, we looked at, we just pulled three indicators here, but very important indicators in terms of utilization and how 
order flow and processes that will be developed um, can be evaluated. So emergency department utilization um, and the comparison of the Blue Cross population. So while one care was at 231, um, the non-attributed Blue Cross population for QHP was at 241. So one care was approved. Um, there was a converse of the inpatient utilization was slightly better at the Blue Cross population of 44.8. But if you look at the risk of the population, there may have been need for increased inpatient. So those are the details you need to dig into why. Or it could simply be they need to be managed better. Um, and that's the data points we're looking at. And then we do have a focus between us. Um, also working with Blueprint on primary care engagement. Um, you saw that with the adolescent well visit, but we're, making, um, we're looking at primary care visits, um, and this is all visits, not just the preventive, um, but we're starting to look at the status to determine how the impact of our joint collaboration allows for greater primary care use and appropriate use when necessary. Then getting into financials and I wasn't going to put 2017 in here because it was shared savings only, but given as the first year of um, Medicaid year zero, which we're the only state that can have a year zero, um, I want to include it because it's something we look at as a, a comparison mark, but it, I wouldn't say it's not part of our risk contract. Um, these are targets that, to remind you, they are based on um, the qualified health plan approved rates by the board. Uh, we did have different arrangements between 2017 and 2018, not just the risk, but we had some corridors. And I wanted to point that out because we renegotiate and evaluate our contract every year and look for opportunities for improvement. So maybe we're modifying the risk adjustment method. The important part is to get to an appropriate target. So what would the expected spend be to use to determine savings and or risk after that? Um, 2020, we look at member months. Um, the amount of members is just, um, it was around 19,000 for 2018, excuse me. Um, 2018, and that equates to those member months. In 2017, it was closer to 24,000 members. Um, and if we look at the results, one care did have risk, so they were 101% over target, but that's a and looking at it, we're close to target. If we were wildly off, we'd have concerns with our target, um, much like the corridor conversation. And so one care did pay us back that not included, and you saw that in our rate filing for next year's QHP. We did want to demonstrate the alignment between our QHP approved rates and the target. Um, and that's one point we discussed before and the impact of the uh, filed rates does impact directly the ACO target. And um, in 2018, there was a reduction in utilization trend put into our QHP rates. If that was not implemented, the ACO would have had savings. Um, so there's a direct correlation within that population between the rate setting. So taking that and Looking at early indicators, um, one year is not a trend, so these are indicators. Um, and looking at what's working and where we see potential um, impediments going forward, um, we are seeing positive impact. Uh, one year is showing actually some considerable impact due to engagement approaches and also impact of where we're going to look going forward. Um, we are looking at, in some areas, the ACO is better than our non Blue Cross attributed population for QHP and other areas, Blue Cross is slightly better, but though that's where we are seeing favorable, um, favorable results. And one part that is underlying all this is we have joint teams working weekly, um, monthly on these programs, looking into the data, but also how we get the data to be actionable. So those are some real bright spots. Um, impeding progress, um, disregard when we're judging on quality for the demographic changes, the small numbers in some of these um, in terms of the denominators, and that can really skew how you're reviewing the performance. And then looking at the alignment of the target in this one in terms of the financial performance. And while we're staying aligned um, with the all pair model and our work that's been going on, we're looking at condition-specific metrics. Should we um, implement some demonstration programs with one care? And while we were keep aligning.
alignment and support with the healthcare model, we're actually looking to see what other meaningful measures show patient engagement, um, clinical health assessments, um, clinical measurement to find it financial impact for programs, and I'm also looking to learn from others on social determinants of health and learning from others at this table of what we're doing with our metrics. And then we did want to come back to the all pair model achievements because putting the populations together in terms of focus on quality allows for Blue Cross, the providers, the ACO to really focus on um, areas of need, looking at a broader population. If Blue Cross was just focusing on it, it would be a small subset of the provider's panel. Um, so we do look at achievement. Um, this is the first year, 2018 was our first year of risk, which we had not been able to move that before with the ACO. Um, improved analytics, uh, clinical opportunities, and first time really aligning um, with Medicaid on our work and really um, leveraging the collaboration between the two. Challenges, um, we are always looking at how we can address challenges, some within our control, some not. Um, we have um, transparently had um, growing issues in terms of data mapping, data sharing, um, which we hammered out a lot together, which really is felt through the collaboration between our teams and working together. Um, expanding our provider network has been an issue. Um, risk and I, from the ACO budget conversation, putting risk on the providers has limited their involvement in our program. Um, and especially, I believe, the alignment of the target setting and our QHP population uh, has created our, a slower growth. I do know we're getting a couple more providers for next year, but it is not at the extent of Medicaid yet. Um, we have uh, had some complexity um, barriers with the fixed payment um, process, which is different in a commercial payer. We are looking to implement uh, um, for that small number of hostels next year, so we're moving along. Um, don't foresee any issue with that, but that has been um, something that has been a difference between us and Medicaid. And then um, we really want to ensure, going back to the risk, the sustainability of the healthcare system, and that's why we've collaborated with One Care how we take the incremental process of risk as we're looking to expand programs and not just placing that within the healthcare system. And then um, the last one is something that I think we've all said, but um, can't be made up for two, sorry. Uh, success cannot be measured in one year. This is favorable. There are key indicators, which is the next slide, which is our final how we're looking at this program. But there's enough, and I think Alicia said it well, to continue to next year. Um, we see value, and especially with the collaboration. And then the last one is something we developed internally, um, understanding the value of the all pair model. These are questions that Blue Cross we ask ourselves. What's the value? In it? And as we're evaluating the program on behalf of clients and members, did health improve, not just a HEDA score? And that's why we're looking at social determinants of health, patient engagement. And this is not, again, a one-year answer, but if we can have favorable indicators over time, these are some of the questions we've discussed. Thank you very much. Uh, website quite extensively, 
do we have a benchmark plan for the QHP population that goes back to 2014, kind of predates everything that we're talking about here. Um, and when you look at that plan, for example, and I haven't done a comprehensive view of it, but uh, I looked at pre-diabetes, for example, and um, in that plan, if you are pre-diabetic, probably the only benefit you get is a prevention visit to the doctor, and then for a specialist fee, which I think is 90 bucks, you can have a vi visit with a nutritionist, but there's nothing in it for fitness, and uh, everything I've read in clinical studies that people have showed me basically say that fitness and nutrition are the two things that keep people from being diabetic, um, from crossing that border to, to becoming diabetic. And in Blue Cross Blue Shield's marketing plan, um, and you have uh, the cost of the annual cost for well care for diabetic is about 7400 bucks um, a year, and uh, a little over 5000 of that comes out of the pocket of somebody uh, who has a bronze plan. So um, I'm just wondering um, if uh, it would seem to me, given that uh, the, um, at least in 2018, the, um, um, <coughs> the QHP plans were, to, in, in Blue Cross Blue Shields arena, over $300 million in premiums. It seems to me that, that benchmark plan might be something that could be scrubbed to make sure that it's aligned with everything we're talking about today in terms of prevention um, and leveraging um, more um, that the uh, extensive amount of money that is being spent through those plans. Is there a question? No. I'll, toss, I'll, I'll toss a coin. Well, what's the, is there a what's the question? Well, um, do you have any plans to um, uh, review the benchmark plan. I've heard people say that, um, oh, there are, you know, it's, uh, people that were around this, you know, before me say that the initial benchmark plan was somewhat of a food fight in terms of a whole bunch of interest trying to get themselves positioned um, um, in that plan. But I would think, given the all payer model targets, that if, if a uh, review of that plan that was totally only tied toward prevention and not to adding benefits, but just to enhance it and align it as best as possible you know, with the population health goals that, that we're all looking at, that that might be a good thing to do. So I'll start, and I'm sure Kelly will have a better answer after I uh, approach the question this way. The uh, idea of paying prospectively and paying providers differently is the potential of the model. What you're describing is taking the model that we've had in healthcare for many, many years, utilization management and other health plan benefit uh, constructs as a way to get to where we want. And I think if you, you know, in, in rooms I'm in to say, are you happy with the current healthcare system? Very few people put up their hands, maybe a few surgeons. But mostly people are saying, yeah, no, we want to approach it differently. Right, and so I think that the idea of putting um, prospectively paid with some risk motivates, uh, should, I think incentivizes the provider community to look at healthcare a different way because they have a responsibility to um, provide access and quality care in their communities. And what I have seen is a motivation to be able to have enough funding through a fee-for-service model to keep their doors open. And so that motivates them to um, uh, do certain things that, that provide margin, and this is away from that. And so I guess I'm, I wanted to say to you that I think that that is exactly what we're talking about with an all-payer model, with a, um, you know, a, a perspective and risk-based agreement with a provider community, is that you can't really do apples to apples because we've been trying that for decades, I feel like to manage the benefit, to, to provide incentives to individuals. To, I think we can still do that in certain places and ways, but I, I just want to take that first uh, approach to the question and say, this is, I, I like the question because I think it highlights what's really different about what the, the model is attempting to achieve. And I appreciate you also saying incrementally with patients and with an understanding that we are experiencing, each of us, a healthcare system that evolved over many decades without a real plan. And I think we can all probably tell that 
but this is a little bit more of an organized approach um, across um, multiple payers and multiple providers trying to bring alignment to our system. So um, I know that doesn't answer right again with the benchmark plans again. I think that's um, a, a, an easier question to not say yes or no to in this moment, but I, I, I think that the question itself does afford me the opportunity to say, this is what we're talking about. It's not necessarily trying to push providers to do things as payers, instead for them to be motivated um, to, or incentivized through the flexibility of a different payment uh, model uh, to do things differently. So I hope that answers. Corey answered it quite well. I think looking at the all pair model as a vehicle to test out some of these payment differences that can really support the same model we we're talking about. So if we got to, even without a fixed payment at a hospital, looking at total cost of care and allowing one care um, and its provider network to allocate funds in a different way, which is what we're talking about. Um, looking at when we pay providers on a per diem or case rate, that would encompass what would be preventive services? Those are things we're discussing in incremental nature. Blue Cross has some of those programs underlying the ACO program already, especially with the mental health and sub substance use disorder um, programs we're piloting. Um, I do think there's always room to look at benefits and the relationship, but within this model, it's actually within the care delivery system. And could we find an innovative way to get people in? for primary care engagement and then find some way for primary care to refer to a food delivery service. Those are things potentially within the legal parameters um, we need to evaluate um, as we look to how we redesign the delivery system and fund the delivery system. I totally appreciate that the all pair model would give um, providers much more flexibility in the services that they provide, but I think in terms of the way the, the benchmark plan is now structured, it's still kind of in the old school, and uh, uh, hopefully, gradually, we can we can move to the new school um, and give providers uh, much more flexibility to how they approach a pre-diabetic um, within their plan. Um, another question I have uh, that, uh, and I had this question uh, for the Diva staff last February, um, is um, getting. Uh, it's noted here that premiums are an issue um, in, 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 in this transition. And I'm trying to, uh, and, and when you look at the, this benefits cliff at 400% of poverty, it's to me very striking where somebody at 399% of poverty is paying $150 per a couple $150 per a plan, and somebody at 401% of poverty is paying $850 a month. And I'm just wondering, what, what I'd like to ask again is that, um, and I think Diva is the best folks to do this, is can we find out what it would cost to help people um, above 400% of poverty to the federal, to the uh, you know, federal definition of affordability, I think it's at 9.4, 9.6%, something like that, because uh, you know, you know, to, to me it's, it's just you know, one of the kind of, you know, leveling and making more equitable and fair the playing field, you know, across um, a number of issues, whether it's the benchmark plan or subsidies or payer mix, uh, that over time we've got to make these relationships um, as equitable as possible. Did I need to ask a question? Or? Can you get your staff to get, get that done? Is that, I mean, I, I guess, I guess you could say yes, because I, I, I mean, we were here to talk about the 2018 ACO results, and so um, I'm, I'm, I guess we're just not prepared to talk about that right now. I mean, I, I'm, we're thinking about the marketplace. We have a QHP responsibility, for sure. As does the Green Mountain Fire Court, that's probably why you're talking to me about it today, since this is probably the first time, a long time, that I've been in front of this board. But um, we are looking at Marketplace as part of the AHS, the, we have a healthcare reform director that leads this sort of um, scope of work, I would call it. Um, there was a legislative request to look into, a mandate to look into the Marketplace, which we are currently engaged in, and our report is is uh, on its way, I would say. So 
um, doing specific data analysis um, based on a question during an ACO review. Uh, we can take it offline if you'd like. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I appreciate the comment. I just, um, it's a good observation. We're here to talk about 2018 results. And I'm trying to uh, you know, look back at the 2018, 2019 um, benefits cliff, and it exists and it's well documented. And um, just trying to put a spotlight on it. Yeah, no debate about the benefits cliff whatsoever. And, and I think actually, if I could tie it to this conversation for a second, I would say. It's exactly what, what you're talking about is financing the healthcare system. We're talking about changing what the healthcare system costs. How the money moves around is, is one conversation. How providers get paid, how much they get paid, what they're able to do with the dollars, and the flexibility they have to do things differently is really what this conversation is about. Robert. both for DIVA and for Blue Cross, um, sort of how you think about performance within the risk quarter in terms of, um, let's say hypothetically, you were to see an ACO be consistently under the price or consistently over the price, how would that impact your thinking as long as it was within the risk quarter? Do you, do you want to take that and talk to everyone? So I think in what we've seen so far for the two years of experience that we have is one year of performance within the corridor that was under the price and one year that was above the price. And I don't know if we necessarily have expectations of where the actual performance is relative to that price other than saying we think that the risk corridor helps um, keep the actual performance and the price fairly close together in terms of how the incentives are structured. I think if there were several years in a row where performance was within the risk corridor but underneath that price, I don't necessarily think from my perspective that that's problematic. I think that that's probably a signal that there were opportunities for more efficiency in spending uh, and that the model would be starting to realize some of that. The only add I would have is that our current total cost of care is based on actuarial, actuarial analysis of trends on those on a fee-for-service model. And I think if we ever got to a place in, in our chart, you had the, we call it the Arnold Palmer with the sort of lemonade and the iced tea, the, I, I'm not sure which is which now, uh, the, the iced tea is the fee-for-service portion of the payment. And um, you know, the more we feel like, um, as in theory, the more we have in the prospective payment um, or uh, the lemonade, um, the less that the corridor will really matter, um, and it will be about getting a, um, a predictable payment system to the providers where they know how much they're going to have to provide um, a certain amount of care, and then they can make decisions um, that aren't all about uh, you know, finding margin to be honest, because you need margin to cover the things in, in, a, in a hospital setting, for example. You need margin on certain um, lines of business to cover the lines of business that lose money. And if you're not motivated in, in that way by, um, by a fee-for-service um, model and you have prospective payment, then it becomes more about how much do they actually spend to provide care. We would still be tracking clinical data and, and what was done. Um, and then I think we would be building year over year. And this is, this is way off, right? We are, we, this, this model is, is truly in its infancy. And, but I think as everyone has said um, so far, um, the early indicators are give us uh, the idea that we should continue to pursue and, and test the pilot. <coughs> Just the two things I would add is um, the difference that we do have between our target settings. Our QHP rate approval is what guides our target. So if there's savings, that's reflected in next year's rate. And then hopefully we'll still have savings because there's room in clinical system reform. If it's always risk, we need to evaluate not only the rate setting, but the relationship between that and the target. Um, we really truly see eventually, and we are 
further and will take a little longer to get to that fixed payment. That could be the model, and I agree with what Corey and Alicia said, and that allows for predictable growth, but we have to get there. And we have to also look at, um, that's gonna take more time, we are lagging in the attributed lines. So I expect the performance to go up and down, given hopefully our network growth, which changes the demographics that I discussed. So I, I think we're a bit off, but it is directly related and shared back within the rate filing. Yeah. Uh, um, first, I think it's positive that we see you know, that we're living within kind of the risk orders across, you know, all three of the, the payer streams. And, you know, the data that we're looking at really is at the aggregate level. And just want to understand how are you leveraging any learnings that you're getting from either within an HSA, because we know HSAs could swing very much different than at the aggregate level. They, they could actually be, you know, putting some of the caps on the upside or downside. Um, as well as between the fixed perspective payment and the fee for service piece, and how you originally allocated that, and what's actually happening. Because you know, one of the things we hear a lot about, of course, is the risk that needs to be taken on, and the concern about taking that risk on at hospital level. So um, it's good, great to see at the aggregate we're we're doing well. Um, you know, but digging, diving down a little bit deeper into HSAs and. Are there learnings there, any reallocations, or anything that you're seeing? Just Sarah, might be for you to kind of take a call the total. So I think we have a couple of early observations in that arena. Um, certainly the size and the number of uh, people in each program makes a difference as we then divide it among however many health service areas. But we are seeing things like, um, you know, in some smaller communities, one or two very expensive cases that might have been unanticipated or just randomly happen over time can really have a dramatic impact on that overall cost at that health service area level. And that causes concerns when we have bigger picture conversations about how much risk a community or a hospital is able to take. And so that's something we're paying attention to as we look at our current strategies around how we share risk and how that gets allocated, as well as what some future models might look like. We also are paying more and more attention to the utilization of services within one CARES network, both how that transfers from one community to another, and also what is happening outside of our network. And more and more, we're recognizing the need to start to dig into the services happening altogether outside of our network and really start to think about what are some of the signals, what could that be telling us, um, where is it about access to services? Um, you know, obviously there are very specialized needs that happen that somebody needs to go to New York City or Boston or even further away to have those services met, and that's crucially important that they're there. And at the same time, how do we think about all of those upstream services, how do we wrap around care and um, look for the opportunities to prevent what might be causing that need from happening in the first place? And just um, one other, I guess, question or point, I guess, on what we're looking at, you know, these quality metrics. And, you know, I know when you showed the um, Medicare, you know, there's quite a lot of detail in where the, the number of quality metrics and where we stand. Um, I think until we really have comparisons against, like, another year or against, you know, non-ACO, ACO populations, it's, it's harder to determine how we're doing. Multiple years, because um, you know, I, I think where Susan was going before, I think you're expressing like, well, we're not really diving into each of those. I, I don't think that's the case. I think the case is more until we look at you know multiple years, it's it's hard to look at something and say, okay, we're in the 50th or the 75th, but not knowing, well, where would we be if we didn't do this? And until you have a couple of years, and until you have. Unfortunately, maybe the set that's not in the ACO versus the ACO, and they would be able to compare those. So it's going to be interesting to watch this progress and to be able to really look at the quality metrics and understand if they're moving. And I don't know, Sarah, if you have any comments overall about, you know, kind of how, how we should think about that and, and where things are, where they stand, where some things might be in a lower decile versus a higher decile? Sure, thank you. All of the caveats that we've discussed previously and today are crucially important. 
and we are limited in our ability to compare, and yet that doesn't tie our hands from thinking about where there are globally opportunities, where we're, as a provider network, not entirely satisfied with the care that's being delivered. And so, as we looked at the 2018 results, which we had in our hands in late September, um, we got together and really started talking with our providers about that question. And so some of the focus areas that are really coming up for us right now in partnership with our payers is, are things like chronic disease management. So looking at uh, the variability that we might be doing very well as a provider network on hypertension management for one program but not for the next. And in trying to understand why could that possibly be. Um, looking at things like diabetes management and recognizing in both of those chronic conditions the way the measures themselves are structured, it's not about having a test. A test is a binary, yes, no. It's about, is that blood pressure under control? Is that blood sugar under control? And we know that clinically, that takes months and months and a strong relationship between primary care or specialist and the patient, the individual, to make that happen. And so we're trying to work at that foundation to really strengthen that engagement, that connection. And then over time, likely the next several years, those are some of the things that we are hoping to see improvements in. Other questions? Uh, I just want to add to that as a Fremont Care Board staff, um, as we work to produce the annual statewide health outcomes and quality report, we have the ability to look at the measures that we're responsible for through the model. Some of those do overlap with payer programs. Um, but what we have been doing is calculating those at um, the level that they need to be reporting for the model, but also where able, looking at those by payer program um, through VCARES. And so um, as we work to sort of get some of these numbers produced and um, if we're seeing higher or low performance relative to the target, being able to uh, easier drill down into what program might be causing some of that difference. I can't hear you, Jess. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, can you just like 16? Tell me when to stop. It's not that care. 2018 quality. It's not that slide. It's one plus one. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, no. Yep. No more. more. Oh, yeah. I think the question might have been, can you describe 2.4%? Explain what that means to all of us. Sure. So if you take the uh, previous slide graphic and what was submitted through the ACO again in their budget submission, at the top of each of those, um, so on the top row, you've got yeah, scoring based on benchmarks for the reporting year. And the benchmark, the ACO, um, the ACO has highlighted their score, what percentile they fall within, and each of those correlate to a number, and they're all listed at the top. So from 1.1 points up to two points. Um, if you add those together, well, first you have to take a look at the ones that have no benchmark or no, no score available, and you take those out. So that's 18 points out of the total, so then you get down to 40 possible points. Of those 40 points, they are 32.95 if you go through and do the math, and that's an 82.4% score. But again, for the purposes of the participation agreement between one care and Medicare for year one of the model, it is a 100% score for reporting. Yep. So just to clarify further, the reason, or part of the reason, that any ECO in its first year is a reporting only is that built into the algorithm for counting those points is a year one to year two comparison and actually a quality improvement points that are normally added. And that can't be calculated if you don't have two data points, which is why inherently they don't try to do that underlying calculation. Thank you. She said thank you. you. <laughs> Other questions? So at this point, we're going to open it up to the public for public comment. Yes, Bob. Yes, um, on uh, the uh, this is for uh, uh, Blue Cross. I see you as a as a partner, and one of your all-payer model challenges statement was 
And one of the challenges of aligning premium setting with the ACO expected spend target. Could you explain a little bit? I mean, I, I can imagine several things that would be difficult there, but what, 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 what do you think is maybe the top issue under that bullet? We, um, in the previous slide, where we discussed the impact of utilization of um, rates approved by the Green Mountain Care Boards. So when we file our rate filing for the qualified health plan, it goes into the review process. And at times there's adjustments, at times there isn't. And if there's adjustments from what we file, those adjustments get passed along to the ACO target methodology. And so if there was a reduction in utilization place within our target, that then reduces the target by the ACO. And we have discussed at various points alignment of our regulatory system between hospital budgets, rate setting, ACO budget, and um, inherently they are connected. So really aligning those processes is what that's getting at. Just to follow up, do you think adequate progress is being made along that area? I can see it's very complex. In the rate setting alignment? Or? In, in the, uh, aligning the, the premiums, what you just said, I think as we have the years go on, we will find out more. This year was our first rate filing that included the ACO payment of risk back. So I do believe that shows the alignment, which is the first step um, in including the performance. Thank you. Yes, Walter. I just have a, a one question and two comments, actually compliments. Um, one, I speak as a patient, and the prior authorization idea of eliminating that, you know, that as someone who almost died from prior authorization before, that is a, a real plus, and I want to compliment that. I also want to compliment uh, Tom on his question about financing. I think it has a lot to do with delivery systems. Whether you like it or not, it does. Um, because so many Vermonters are priced out of the system now with the deductibles, co-pays, all the rest of it, can't get insurance, are forced off of eligibility, and so on and so forth. The next one is delivery system reforms, and I have this mostly to set of patients. And outside of the complexity of all the all payer model is that when we talk delivery system reform, that means that we'll, a patient will get more than 10 minutes with a doctor, and that's if you're doing the, or with a primary care provider, and that's the question. Because when you go into a primary care provider, if you get 10 minutes, you're doing good. And so I was thinking that as a patient going into a doctor's office. You want to try that one, Sarah? Well, sure. So I think the intention under these value-based payments is to provide more flexibility for patients and providers together to identify what the needs are for that unique individual and to work in a better, more informed way around how to meet those needs. And that can be one-on-one -on -one between provider and patient, or it could be extending that care team, which is a lot of the work that we do. And so that might be into other providers in the office or into the community. But that flexibility around uh, not having to count 10 or 15 minute visits in the same way because that's tied to one specific fee is a, a very important underlying principle in these value-based payments and in the care delivery transformation that we're all working towards. We're not there yet, but I think we're starting to make some progress. I know. <laughs> I think it was a great question, Walter, especially after the uh, story that was in the press yesterday about people being asked not to ask other questions of providers. That is just so far going in the wrong direction. That, you know, my understanding is that has been addressed and uh, will be straight away, but I, I'm assuming, Sarah, that um, there is absolutely no incentive for anybody to limit the conversation between a patient and a provider. Absolutely not. It's really about that relationship and identifying the needs and the plan to support those needs. My bigger fear, Walter, is that if we don't start doing something differently with higher education, we're not going to have enough providers. It's a national problem, and uh, that's my biggest fear. I mean, I take a look at you know just calling to schedule a. a a colonoscopy in Rutland. It's a, at least a four-month wait, and I know that one doctor is retiring, 
they've been recruiting for a while. It's not easy to, to find doctors, and those are the type of things that really scare me. I agree, and at the practice I've been going to for his, I've been through four or five primary care providers, and every single one of them is A, either retired or B, gone underneath the umbrella of a, a hospital. It would be uh, so nice if everybody had a provider that was with them for a long period of time yeah. so they actually knew the patient. And I've I lost providers it. because of network troubles. Um, one insurer takes over from another and kicked that, everybody out of the network. Um, I've gone through all kinds of mess with providers. So, I mean, I, I'm with you on that one. It's a problem. Yeah. Other members of the public? Yes, over here. Yep, you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Patrick Flood. Uh, since the One Care budget was presented about three weeks ago, I've been trying to better understand the Medicare number. And I don't want this to turn into a big, long discussion, so there may be a better way to get me the answers. And I apologize for being dense, because probably everybody else in this room understands it. When I, when I go to the last uh, PowerPoint slide that purports to show the Medicare. Yes. The first, my, I have several questions. I don't expect them all to be answered in the next two minutes. But the first one is, is it 17 million or is it 13 million? Because when I do the math on those two columns, it's not 13 million. And so I don't know what the correct number is, number one. Um, am I missing something? My glasses are always. Is that not, say, 379? Or oh, 339, 322? For um, um, sequestration. Oh, right. For what? Sequestration at the federal level. So there is a difference and there is an adjustment, but we can document that more clearly. Um, well, that would be good. Uh, the other thing was, uh, the second question is, when the budget was originally presented, I was very surprised to see in the spreadsheet that was included uh, that one care was claiming 13 plus million dollars in savings in Medicare. I thought that was a pretty striking result. Today I see, well, that's not exactly right, or maybe it is, and we're just describing it differently. The line on the bottom says, 7.7 .7 million in advanced share savings and 5.6 in shared savings. So I have a couple of questions. First of all, I've never heard the com I've never heard the term advanced share savings. Is that what it is? Yeah. 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 Y
So you just answered my other question, which is the Medicare spend was anticipated to be X, and one care came in $13.3 million under that in terms of spending for me its Medicare patients, correct? Yes. Okay, so the next question, which we do not have time for today, was I would think everybody would be extremely interested in how you did that. What care changes happened to earn $13 million in savings? And I would see that. I agree with you, it's a longer conversation. I think for us, it's a investment in multiple strategies, things like primary care, investing in partnerships with our continual care partners through our complex care coordination program, looking at quality improvement opportunities and aligning with the blueprint. We've discussed some of those things in our written uh, submission for our 2020 budget and in our testimony, but we'd be happy to provide additional details as well. And who would I contact to get that additional detail? You can contact me and I'll put you in touch with the right people. Okay, so just, I, I really do mean to shut up. I want to keep going, but what I will be asking for is, I understand you've made various investments, but the question is, where did the savings actually occur, occur? In hospitalization, in ERs, in doctor's offices? Where was the spend less? And I'll, let's move on. So Commissioner, welcome back. <laughs> We're worried that you've walked off into the sunset, so it's great questions. Good to see you. So just to follow up, I understood that the um, 7.7 .7 million was for um, Blueprint, Community, SASH, and Community Health Teams, and that it was a pass-through from the state of Vermont, federal and state money. And so it's confusing that it's being described as savings. Right, it, I mean, it, it does sound confusing, but the, I think the, the caveat is what I mentioned earlier is that one care is still on the hook to earn those savings. That's why it's called advanced shared savings. So. Hey, can you just identify yourself for the record? Oh, my name is Julie Wasserman. Oh, yeah, so did that answer your question? I mean, so the, it's not just a pass-through. One care is still responsible for earning those shared savings. Um, otherwise, they have to come up with another funding mechanism for the blueprint and community health teams and such. Since it is a, it is invested investment up front. Um, again, Julie Wasserman. Um, the advanced shared savings term was a reference in the Fremont Care Board table on share, uh, total savings and loss in um, the uh, results for 2018. Uh, and it only seemed to refer to budget in 2019. So uh, is advanced shared savings part of 2018 as well as 2019? Yes. The the shared savings amount that is, so the advanced shared savings term comes from the all fair model agreement between state and CMS, CMI. Um, that dollar amount gets trended forward to pay for the blueprint and SASH and CHT as part of the model. So without that agreement, without that pass through through one pair, who distributes the dollars to more than just their network providers. It's for the entirety of the blueprint, so not every provider is in the ACO network. Um, it's, it's, the it's the only funding mechanism for those programs. From Medicare. From Medicare. Can I just clarify something? The, the concept is, is in the l model agreement. I don't think the l agreement actually has the term advanced shared savings. The idea is that Medicare was going to put this money uh, towards these programs continue the funding that was previously through a different demonstration program. The only way to fund that is through the benchmark. So that money is included in the benchmark, uh, paid out in advance with the expectation that the ACO is going to, um, you know, its, its target has been increased. It's going to have to um, live within that or if it doesn't, then, um, you know, it's on the hook. Is that? Um, we might want to, it is, it is unclear, yeah. um, because even when Sarah 
prior to this was showing how the number was built up. You know, she specifically showed, you know, the, the number being built up and then adding in the, another $8.8 .8 million into the total. And so um, we built up the base number for non-ESRD, the ESRD number, and then we added the $8.8 million, .8 million in. And so I think the confusion is either is that 8.8 .8 million on top of what we would get normally, and then it passes through one care, and then one care utilizes that 8.8 .8 million in different, you know, different ways. But if that is the case, then it's not really we, we may name it a shared savings, but it's not really savings that were generated from the program. Versus if the other case would be in the base number that we got in the non-ESRD number, that it would have been higher. And it's, it's been reduced by eight million. It's in that base, and then it's to clear that it's in that base is a non-claims amount. So that's why it gets trended forward and then removed again. It's or recognized as not. Yeah. So I think it's unclear the way that the, the number was built as well when we when we did that earlier. So I can mm -hmm. see people having confusion on that. So maybe well, we'll then it is complicated. And frankly, without the all care model agreement, that number would not exist. Because if you were doing Medicare Next Generation, there would be no money for Blueprint or SASH, advanced or otherwise. The other public comment. Yes, on the way back. Dale. Um, page 12. I believe it's page 12. Yep. Aligning the premium setting with ACO expected spend target. Um, give me a second. I was hearing an echo. Um, that's really distracting when you're hearing an echo and you're hearing it. I'm curious to know when it comes to the premium setting, uh, being aligned to the ACO expected spend target, how medical inflation and inflation in general fits into that, especially when you have an inflation rate that might actually theoretically be above their savings, possibly. And so I've kind of always had this question in the back of my mind, when you start asking for your rates, are you including the medical inflation? Um, if, they, if one care comes back and says, because of medical inflation alone, we're um, setting this as this is going to be our rates in the new year. How do you balance that all out? And at the same time, I don't want you to balance it out too much because I want to have that visibility, transparency about did we actually save something or did we just end up paying it in the premiums in terms of how you uh, did your risk assessment even? What if risk changed? Risk can be a form of inflation. So good question in terms of the relationship of the premium and I'm not our actuaries who spend a lot of time here. So with the caveat of what our buildup of rate is, obviously it includes utilization trend, inflation, a number of components, risk of the population, demographics. Um, but the difference from how you described it, it's not the ACO setting their target and going Blue Cross, pay us X. What we have is the relationship where we set our target based on that premium. So the premium is set first for the overall rate. And then we work with one care to make sure it is reflecting the appropriate rate they validate and work with us. So it's not setting a higher rate than what is actually in the approved premiums. Okay, thank you. The other members of the public. Yes, Susan. Um, I Susan Aronoff from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. And first of all, Mr. Chair and other members and staff of the Green Mountain Care Board, I want to sincerely thank you for holding this hearing today. Um, I think that it's really important that the Green Mountain Care Board in its regulatory role 
make some efforts to find out if the all-payer model is actually either improving quality or reducing costs or reducing the rate at which costs grow. And I think that holding a hearing like this and collecting this information is one way that you can do that and that will help the members of the public that makes itself trust that you're a regulator that's truly interested in the quality of Vermont healthcare and um, whether or not this um, model is working. I have one general question and then one specific question. So my general question is either directed to you, to Diva, or directly to Diva. In the past, and Diva's been collecting data on ACOs since at least 2014. So there have been quality and performance measures for one care, for other accountable <laughs> care organizations and shared saving programs and other programs. Diva's gotten really good at, at doing this. Diva used to have reports on what the quality results were, as you guys mentioned, for people in the model and people out of the model, so that you could look and see whether or not the people attributed were having better or worse results, greater or lower utilization of the ER. Whatever the measures were, there was a separate set of numbers for the non-attributed lives. So I'm wondering if Diva is still doing that, and if so, if that information could be made public as well. So since it's a question for Diva, I'm going to defer to Commissioner Gustafson. Well, thank you, because I'm going to defer to Alicia's been working on shared savings in, in our, our uh, shared savings program since, I think, the beginning, to be honest. Thank you for that question, Sue. Uh, we do plan on putting together a summary of the quality results that will allow for a comparison of 2017 and 2018 within the ACO program, and we can also add to that the results of the full Medicaid population. Uh, I would say the limitation currently is that we don't have the ability um, with our vendor at present to do a comparison of the attributed population and the non-attributed population separately, but we can look at the attributed population as a subset of the whole population. I believe we did have a summary that was available for 2017 with that comparison, and we are planning to update that with another year. And, and I think you mentioned quality. Would that be the same for financial performance as well? So we don't quite look at financial performance uh, in an apples-to-apples -apples way because we're not setting an agreed-upon price for the non-attributed comparison population. Uh, I think we could probably spend some time thinking about what a helpful comparison might look like, though, um, because I, I do recognize that that is a, a better way to understand this in the broader context of the Medicaid program. That would be great. So that follow-up would be separately. So my specific question is on slide 29. It is the Medicaid um, results. And while you're getting there, I just want to say one thing about the Medicare results, which had a similar chart, is I really think it would behoove all of us to look at the quality performance of both in Medicaid, Medicare, and in Blue Cross. Medicare results, yes, they're getting 100% this year because it's a reporting year given to new AC new ACOs or ACOs in new programs, it's kind of ironic because one here is one of the oldest ACOs in the country, but yes, they're getting 100% as a result of our program design. But you can look beneath that and see what their actual quality scores were, and I would encourage you, especially the board members and the staff, to look at the quality performance, especially the numbers for things like all-cause readmission. It's a really important number. It's not going in the right direction. Our Medicare quality results last year were about 90% lower than they had been the previous year. So if our Medicare quality results are continuing to go down or to go down on significant um, measures like all-cause readmission, I think that is something we should all be paying attention to as we consider whether or not this is the right model, the right direction to be moving in. In terms of a specific result on this Medicaid chart, Last year, this was a new year of MedPay Next Gen, did the same thing and gave one care um, full credit for reporting only. This year, that's not the case, except for a couple where there were benchmarks or whatever um, those NAs were there. The number that I want to 
call your attention to. It's the third one up from the bottom, initiation of alcohol and other drug dependence treatment. You'll see that we're fairly, fairly eked into the 25th percentile. The 25th percentile would be 38.62. We got a 38.87. That's a pretty low score. It's better than last year. Last year they earned a zero. They were below the 25th percentile. This year, they're in the 25th percentile. They got a point. My understanding is, is that um, Viva has some kind of quality performance improvement project set up with OneCare to address the results of last year's quality performance, including this drug initiation measure. It looks like there's been some impact because it did move into the 25th percentile. But I'm wondering whether or not you have any plans to address quality performance based on the 2018 results. I'll start and then Sarah, you might have some additional comments. Uh, I think there has been work at DIVA historically and performance improvement projects related to this measure. I'd also note that this is a, a tricky measure because the definition that we have been using in the first several years of the program relies on claims data exclusively and some of our state data systems where information about some of these uh, encounters lives has not always shown up in claims data. So something that DIVA has done in the past several years is looking at ways that we can draw on those other data sources to get a more accurate picture of performance relative to this measure. And it's something that we've discussed doing in the future is modifying the approach that we use for reporting on performance to include those additional data sources. Um, I think the other thing that would be important to note is the year-over-year -year comparison that you mentioned, um, seeing that there was some improvement from 2017 to 2018. I think one of the challenges in looking at that year-over-year -year comparison is, is that we had a very different population in 17 with the 29,000 approximate attributed members going into 2018 with uh, significantly more numbers. And so with the change in population, uh, I think it's a little bit difficult as some of the other panelists have mentioned to make appropriate comparisons year over year. Um, and I think I would defer to Sarah in terms of any of the quality improvement activities planned. So I do want to note that one of the challenges that providers in OneCare's network continue to face is that with a suite of very important quality measures around both mental health and substance use disorder, we are not able to receive the detail of the claims information, which means that on a month-to-month -month or quarterly basis, our providers in general don't have that information. They don't have signals of whether performance is getting better or worse or staying the same. And so we've been looking and partnering first with Blue Cross Blue Shield and now looking to partner more with DIVA around some alternatives to be able to get de-identified but still um, data that is timely. It's not nine months after the end of a performance year before we find out how we were doing as a provider network. And as we're able to do that, with our example in partnering with Blue Cross Blue Shield, we're actually sending that aggregate de-identified data into our provider network and starting to talk to them about how do we use that, where are the opportunities, and we're really excited about that partnership and looking to expand it with DIVA in the year to come. And so sometimes it's getting creative and thinking about different ways of how to crack that tough nut, and that's one of the examples of what we're working on. Okay, any members of the public? One clarification, Kevin. Sure. Um, so, Sue, you referenced uh, the risk standardized all condition readmission measure. Um, for Medicare, actually, the performance on that, though I would recommend comparing to last year's results, actually increased. That measure is inverted. So, a lower score is a higher percentile. So, they actually did perform higher if you are looking compared to 2017. I'm not going to open the computer yet. It might have been a different one, but it's still not a very good number, I don't think. 40%? They're in the 70th percentile for 2018. Go ahead. Oh, I'm the biggest. 
I was just going to thank the panel because I, I think that that's it for the public comment. I think uh, uh, this is really good to shed some transparency on, on what we see a lot as far as the reporting, but the public doesn't get a chance to uh, see the work that's being done. So this is um, really good. And I want to thank uh, Susan Aronoff for really uh, putting the, the bug in our ear to, to get this out in public where it can be filmed and uh, the public will have an opportunity to uh, see exactly what's happening. So um, uh, thank you to all the panelists. I know that uh, you're doing uh, really good work. And uh, with that, we're going to uh, let you go. Um, Continue with the board meeting. Is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a new board business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Uh -huh. Second. Moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. <laughs>